So thank you to be there for this uh, last uh, MI week uh, session, almost done. Uh, one hour left and then everyone will be okay. So um, the title of this session is Using PPL to Build and Deploy Large Scalable Application. And we will talk about also what the NXG uh, will do for us with PPLs and compiled code uh, in the future and already. Uh, and in the title, I put large scalable, of course, but large application because PPL will benefit to you more if you are using developing large applications. It benefits to everyone, it can benefit to everyone, but especially you will see more benefits if you are dealing with large applications. So who is using PPLs already in a regular flow? Who tried maybe to use PPL, but it was too much pain? I just remember. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. All right. So maybe I, I define what is a large application, and it, it, it might be different for everyone. So an application between zero and thousand VIs, maybe thirty libraries. And when I say a VI, it's a VI in a one screen. Okay, it's not. A, it's not deep. Yeah, exactly. So this is not really a large application, and PPL will not really. Be benefit a lot in that situation. Um, I, I'll say between 1,000 VI and 5,000 VIs, 30 to 200 libraries, that's a large application. And over than that, it's a very large application. That, that's my sense. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the link for the, 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 the presentation content. So you will be able to uh, download the, the slides as well as uh, some benchmarking Code. So I will show you some benchmarking with PPLs, and if you want to reuse that code and maybe benchmark your own applications, you know, it's just scripting, so you can look how I've done that and create it and reuse it. Uh, is of uh, StudioBots, so StudioBots uh, is an alliance partner company based in Quebec City. We have operations in the US and Europe. Um, we do mostly services, LabVIEW development, LabVIEW consulting. Uh, our main area of expertise is deploying the application, deploying software, deploying code remotely. And we do also uh, training. Uh, and we are DQMH trusted as well, so we know DQMH and we can help you with DQMH. Oh, we have we have uh, two products on the LabVIEWTools network, VLT, it's our main product, it's been there since uh, 2012. Uh, you can use it for free up to five deployments, and you pay. Uh, but you can use it for free with no time limitation. And there is another cool tool to automatically uh, generate con like view controls, custom controls uh, from pictures, and it does the recoloration of your pictures directly in the, in the application. So let's start with a real customer request, who is asking us to create an automated test system for uh, LNB thing at the end of the hour. Uh, we are asked to develop two tests, phase noise test, oscillation test, and uh, log the results to the database and generate some reports. So very classic application that probably most of you uh, have worked with. So we do our homework and we define you know, how we are going to, going to componentize our application and decouple our application. So we have a main application, okay, they want us to do tests. Uh, we will need to hardware inputs and hardware outputs, so we create components for hardware inputs, hardware outputs. We want to do logging, component for logging, we want to do report. Raise your hand if you find this is a good decomposition of the application. You. <laughs> I'm just asleep. <laughs> okay, it's not decoupling. There is no decoupling. Um, and it's not crazy. Okay, there is no reason to group all the hardware inputs in a component. It's not what we want to do. We want functional decoupled components. So I'll, I'll explain a little bit more what is coupling and cohesion. Uh, high coupling means that if you change something in one of your components, in one of your modules, it will impact many of your other modules and we will have to rewrite code in, in a lot of, of modules. Uh, the opposite, if you have a low coupling in your application, when you make a change in one of your modules, it has a minimal impact on the other modules. So it's more reusable. And 
in order to decouple your modules, you have to think of them as really independent software components. Like forget about the, the entire application, think about your module as independent uh, program almost. Uh, and to help you to do that, you should, uh, you know, leverage design patterns, framework, actor framework maybe, EQMH, uh, state machines, uh, create abstraction layers, that, that will help you to decouple your code. And um, I mean, also to decouple your code, you need to write cohesive code. Uh, high coupling is not good. Cohesion, the, the code is cohesive if the functionality in, in the functionalities in your module have a lot in common. And you can describe the responsibility of your module in, in a single, simple sentence. No and, no or. Don't use unrelated dependencies in your module. It's not because you want to log, uh, if you want to log your hardware measurements, you don't have to make a dependency between your uh, logging module and your hardware module. You know, it, it, it's uh, using unrelated dependencies. So low cohesion, it's not good because components are not sure what they do. And high cohesion means they have a very well-defined responsibility. Do you consider no composition to be coupling? OO composition to be coupling? Like class. What is OO composition? Well, in your classes, if, they're, if they contain other classes. You know, they, they're composed of other classes. Yeah, if they have a lot in common, yeah. they, they can the be. the same thing? Definitely, it happens that you have, can have a component with multiple classes, and they, they take care of the same responsibility. So that would be fine. Yeah, what it's bad is when you are putting the kitchen sink and the apple tree in the same basket. They're not related at all. You can put them. Yeah, but make sure you decouple them from exactly. interfaces. Yeah. Yeah. No static coupling. Exactly. So the recipe of success, um, low complete modules, High cohesive code, and you have something that you can reuse, scalable. You can, you're gonna be successful. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll not show you the opposite. Uh, <laughs> way it could be bloody. Uh, high coupling modules, low cohesive code, not reusable, not scalable. You're gonna fail. Um, so let's do our homework again, and we now decouple our application. We have the main application, the main UI. Uh, and uh, we uh, have a module that is a test sequencer. It will be able to run multiple kind of tests, whatever the test it is. We have phase noise tests, one module, oscillation test, one module, and they call each one the module that is responsible of a particular instrument. The logger is one module, etc., etc. And you can see pretty much that almost each of these modules can be reused in another application. If you have another application <laughs> where you need to have a XML file config, you take your XML file config module and you can reuse it as is, okay? You need to communicate with your signal analyzer in another application, you take your module and it can be reused as is as well. So sometimes there is some modification to do, but at least it's a lot more reusable. So we implement that in LabVIEW, this is our project, and we create folders with all your code, etc. Uh, one folder per component. Do, do you think it's enough? You like that? You do that? No. Okay. You should you should put you should group your components not into folders but into libraries. And why using libraries? Libraries, it, it's a way to organize your source code so it can be indep independent, independently so it developed and you can define a responsible for that library and it will take care of developing this library, maintain this library, you can test a particular library uh, independently, you can reuse of course and share that, that library. Um, there are all other advantages of using libraries, uh, you namespace your VIs so you will avoid name conflicts. In, might happen multiple times that you need to open a connection to something like that. So you can easily have a name conflict. So libraries avoid that. Uh, 
that they share a common icon header. So when you look at your code, it's, it's mentally easier to find out which component is part of this code. And also, it, it enables discoverability. If you drag the BI in your project, it's going to bring up the entire library. So you see all your components, all, all the API available in your, in your module. Well, Matthias, just, just for greasy Lino here, uh, classes are a type of library, so this is the same thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, library uh, provides access code. So let's look at uh, the configure the yeah five uh, five config libraries. You can define a private access code. There are other access code, uh, public, community, private, and um, this way you uh, you prevent. Uh, basically the use of these private VIs outside of the library. So you make sure it, it stays private, private and only the public API is, is used by the other components. So it really helps decoupling your code. So we talked about library. Who is not using library today? You mean like classes? Yeah, no, like just, you know, grouping the eyes in folders and uh, not okay. especially grouping so that one way. one mother folder. Yeah. Yes. Mother. Folder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to say it, but as a consultant, I see a lot of that code. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and we see a lot of local variables and stack statements with you. And all that. So, let's compare now uh, uh, with it library and public project library and the, subject, the, the topic of today is public project library. Uh, so LabVIEW library, the extension is LValid. Uh, it's multiple files on, on disk, okay? When you have a library, it's the LValid file, which is an XML file that is pretty much kind of a directory of the files contained in your library and all the VIs. And you really, you put them in a folder. Okay? It's easier to reuse and share grab that folder, you give it to someone else, and it has the entire library. This is source code, so it can be edited, and it can be portable across targets and uh, operating system. The PAC project library, uh, you add the P to the extension, like PAC project. <laughs> it's one file on this. It's compiled code, you cannot change it, it's immutable, and so you must rebuild it for each target with a different operating system. And I assume also per version of lab, correct? Yeah. Yes. No, not yes. starting at 2017. Well, uh, I, I talked about that. <laughs> that yeah, Fabio has a good point. Starting with LabVIEW 2017, uh, there is backward compatibility for uh, back project libraries. So you don't have to, if you build a back project library for in LabVIEW 2017, you can reuse it, you can consume it in LabVIEW 2018 and further versions. You cannot consume a 2018 PPL in LabVIEW 2017. Um, so, the next slides, I, I show a lot of benefits of PPLs, uh, but don't worry, there is also a lot of caveats, okay? Um, I'll talk about the caveats at the end, so I'm not going back and forth, so, uh, uh, so yeah, just don't think that it's just all benefits. There are some pain, pain points that come with PPL, and they, they will come after, later. So one of the, the big advantage of the PPL I see is uh, <laughs> reducing the time to load uh, your application. Because the um, LabVIEW library, the LVLib, must be recompiled before use. And the PPL is already compiled, so you save the time of the compiler. Uh, it makes a huge difference if you build your libraries into uh, PPLs, especially if you have large projects with large number of libraries. So I did some benchmarking. I have a main VI that is calling from one to 20 libraries. There is 50 VIs in each library, so 20 libraries is 1,000 VIs. And the main VI is calling all the VIs in all libraries, okay, for the benchmarking. And you can see that with just 20 libraries, it's 65 times faster the same code if you compile your LVLib into PPLs. So I have some customers. When I load the project, the main VI, I have to charge one or two hours before I can start coding. Just because I need to open the code, because it's all source libraries. 
This one surprised me a little bit. Um, the time to log the project is actually longer if you have a rely on PPLs than uh, libraries. But it's just two times, you know, faster to work with a library. So it's, it's not like the 65 times. It's not a big deal. And I was brainstorm a little bit about that. And uh, I think it, it has to do that basically a PPL, is, it's a one file. So it's a larger file to load. When you load a library, you can basically just pass the XML and you have the content of your library. When you load your project, probably you need kind of a part, load the entire file. Did you benchmark between uh, debugging enabled and disabled? Uh, no, it's all debugging disabled. Because if you build your PPL with, with the beginning enabled, it basically keeps the source code. So uh, it's, it was not the purpose of that, that benchmark. It was not um, so it, it's not that much pain. So just two times faster. And it, it makes sense. You, you, you load an entire file uh, that is larger and contains all the code instead of just load, loading the, the directory of your library. The big advantage of using PPL is not only the time to load, but the time to build. Okay, when you build an exe that call uh, lblibs, that view resaves all the file in libraries and maybe do some recompilation. If you build an exe that call PPLs, that you just take the PPL and copy it. In, it's a simple <coughs> file copy on MISC. Again, it can make a huge difference if you have large applications when you need to rebuild your main application. Okay, so some benchmarking again. Same libraries, same number of libraries, 1 to 20. Uh, and we went to 12 times faster to build the application that calls PPLs versus the application that calls the same libraries source. Yeah, but at least it's linear, right? Yes. So don't get worse. Yes. So, the application that use LVLibs, if you build this application into an executable, you get one executable that is probably for this size of application around 40 megabytes. Um, if you build the same application into PPLs, you just have basically your main VI. It's, 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 it's simplified here, but you just have the main VI in your exe, and then each PPL is its own product. So when you double click on your application to open the application, you just have four megs to load in the memory. So your application shows up immediately. You immediately have the icon, and then you can start maybe to have a progress bar while you load your other modules and PPLs. Chris. So I'm going to demonstrate a fair amount of ignorance here. Um, if you go back to your previous slide, you were linking with all the correct? Yes. And okay, then there's this magic that happened, and you started linking against LV lib or pack project libraries. Yes. Can you walk me through the workflow necessary to make that transition? In other words, I was linking against the VI, now I'm not linking against the VI. Did I have to do anything? You have to build each of your library into a PPL. And then? Um, and then yeah, you sure. need to run the conversion tool. <laughs> so, I have to, so I run the conversion tool. Does that mean that all the VIs that used to call VIs do I have to update the caller to now point to a Absolutely, PPL? yeah. So, so is that manual or is that automated? That's manual, and that's part of the pain. So now, when we, I, there, there's I, a manual. There is a replace, uh, replace, replace yeah, as there pack is a library. replace pack library yeah. with, or replace with, with library. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to go to each caller and replace them. Okay. You can replace, basically, you okay. <laughs> right-click on the and believe and replace with pack library. So there's a reverse and, of that. No, no, no. Uh, uh, 2019. 2019. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So the reason why that, that he's going to show that. Okay, so the reason why that, um, that concerns me. So now I'm a, I'm a developer, and I have my main VI. I called into a PPL. Oh, there's a bug. Well, so do I have to go to the PPL source, re-export it, reinstall it, or is there a way that I can edit in place? No, no, no. Okay. And, and that's part also, I mean, for me, it's the beauty of the modularity. You have an issue in that PPL, that's, that's its own product. You go in the source of that product, it gives the product, you run your test, you reveal it, you run it. Going to PPLs commits you 
to build map and packages and making sure that your package is good to go before it goes up and, and testing the package by itself, which is really it's how a lot of you need to have a solution. Which was why you gathered all your requirements in the first place and wrote your yeah. unit tests. So I move forward. Oh, I am a champion now. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We have a lot of content to talk. So I advise the sponsors. Can we all have a talk with this over beer later? And there is another carrot. Matthias is going to show that. So you can see here that basically each PPL is it's. It, it's it's on file, okay. So it's also easier to distribute and share uh, these components because it's just a file. And if you deal with complex installers, as it might will help you also. It's easier to distribute a single file to install a single file than installing multiple files, etc. Uh, additional benefits: so distribute and share your module as single files, and you can see that. Each PPL also have a trial version. So when you get a bug, it's a lot easier to track down your bugs to a particular version of your library. You can publish smaller updates. No need to redistribute the entire 40 meg application if you just have a bug in your report PPL. You will build the report PPL and have we, have we, did I recall we graduated from the point where if signal analyzer 1.0 needs to be updated to 1.0? One, and the API hasn't changed, that I can't just swap them on disk. Yes. Now? Okay. Most, mostly. Mostly. If the external API has not changed, and if you have checked the adapt colors. Okay. Uh, when you build this, this is an option for that. Okay. okay. And there's a few times where we've seen it not work and we've had to rebuild. I don't know exactly why. Uh, but but it's much, it's, much it's, less, it, it's, it's much tricky less with less. tag definitions. Uh, if you update a tab definition, even if you don't change the public API, most likely yeah. you're going to need to rebuild also the colors. You can share your API while protecting your IP, okay? The source code has been removed. There is no way someone can go to Google and type how to crack a new password protection and figure out what's in your code. Okay? No, that that's possible. Unless you compile with debug. Uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Same for an executable. Compile with debug, you can debug and see the source. Um, I'll talk about plugin architecture, which is a big benefit of PPLs. And I, can, I could spend two hours talking about plugin architecture, so I'll try to not do that. So, what's a plugin? It's a software component that adds specific features to an existing application. Basically, when an application supports plugin, it enables customization. Third party developers can extend your or an application. You can add features without modifying the, the main application. The main application only depends on the plugin interface, not on specific plugins. You reduce the size of the application, as we saw earlier. You can load plugins dynamically as you need them, so you have a better usage of the memory. And the installation of plugins can be completely independent of the installation of the main application. So let's work through the process of that. First, you start with your plugin interface. What is the plugin interface? It's a library, because you need a library to build a PPL. And then you have a class, which is the parent class for all your plugins. And you uh, implement the dynamic dispatch methods <coughs> that you will need for all your plugins. It's optional, but I like to build my plugin interface uh, into a PPL, but you, anyway, it's going to be loaded with the main application, so you could keep it source. If, if you don't do it as a um, plugin or a PPL, you can get multiple copies in your runtime memory. Yes. Because then each plugin that you load that uses mm -hmm. a shared library will load a copy of it. That's a very good point. So Mark is saying that if you don't build it in the PPL, any plugin that is using the plugin interface will create its own copy of the plugin interface code. So build it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you also at Ivan County still in classes. You in one case you use the PPL, in other cases don't. You're right. The namespace issues of successor has led to this, but the actual the key extension at the end is noticed by LabVIEW when you're loading and it goes, oh, if you're not a member of this, you can't touch it. Yes. So you need that consistency across whichever you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
that we have to do. So I like really to build into PPL. Um, and put everything in the same folder. Define a, a plugins folder, and you're going to put your plugin interface and all your plugins in the same folder. Where are your unit tests? Uh, it's not a session on unit test. It's a session on PPL. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, you should have unit tests and maybe other tests that will check, make sure before you build that you disable the debugging, maybe if you build the release, etc. Uh, so you said you put all the plugins for this application in the same location? Yes. What if your plugins are designed to be used across applications? I'll talk about that. Uh, plugins, so again, you create a separate project. Each plugin has to be considered as its own product. You create the library because you need it to be a PPL, and you have the, the uh, you create a child class and it inherits from the plugin interface in the PPL. Okay, you see the extension P. So when you build your plugin, you set the class to inherit from the plugin interface class that is built already into a PPL, not the source. Okay. And then you implement your dynamic dispatch overrides for what you need in your plugin. And you build your PPL, place it in the same folder where you have your plugin interface and your other plugins. And you check exclude dependent pack libraries when you build uh, in your build specifications. Those are separate, they are independent products. If you don't check that, since the plugin depends on the plugin interface, it's going to recopy the plugin interface PPL into the plugins directory, but you already built the plugin interface as an independent component. So always, I don't see any case really where you could exclude. There is a current bug with that right now. Um, it has to do with the level of depth between your source code and your destination and your PPLs. If those don't match, it changes paths on you and your PPLs won't find that <coughs> PPL. There is some workarounds to that. Yeah, there, there can be some cross-linking issue, and uh, the PPL basically the VI saved the relative path uh, when you build into a PPL, and you, you could have some issue if you have large, uh, larger hierarchies. But I'll show how you can uh, uh, trick that. So in the end, you end up with a plugin folder with your plugin interface and all your plugins. From your main application, you're going to want to a BI to basically get the path where your plugins are. So usually, you try to do that relatively to the application. But it could be something if you reuse your plugin into uh, uh, across multiple applications. I mentioned that again later. You should agree on a central location where you put all your plugins, and it's going to be always the same. See my company, my plugins, and you know it's there. And if your customer wants to put them elsewhere, it, it works and it's, it's, it's responsibility. Then you want to list the plugins. So how to list the plugins? You list the folder where your plugins are for the extension uh, in the link B. And we're just going to filter out the plugin interface. Uh, so I like to use the statically the class, so if I change the name of my plugin interface, etc., I don't need to update that code. Uh, and I get the plugin interface and believe, and I just filter it out, so in the end, I have my plugins one, two, three, when I put this here. In order to load the plugin, this is the whole magic of the uh, plugin architecture. It's using the factory pattern. And basically, you're going to uh, dynamically get the default value of your plugin class and cast, cast it to the plugin interface class. So then you have your plugin interface class object on which you can call any dynamic dispatch method for your particular plugin. So this is really the magic of the plugin architecture. From your main application, we can see that we load the plugin, and then we can run our dynamic dispatch method on the plugin, regardless of which plugin is loaded. If we look at the project, the application only depends on the plugin interface, not on the plugins themselves. So 
So I show you, oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. So let's run this application. I like execution. I list the plugins. I populate my ring. And then I run plugin one. So I load my plugin. And you can see that at that point, my plugin one is now in memory in my project. <coughs> and then I can uh, use the dynamic dispatch on it. Any questions? So sometimes you want to unload. You can see that after I finished the execution, the plugin is still in memory. You would like maybe to unload that plugin from memory for many reasons. Let's say you want to update your applications without restarting an application. Sometimes you have some critical applications running. They don't have. They, they should never stop, but you need to update. So if I update my PPL on disk while it's in memory, LabVIEW doesn't see the change. The only way that the class is able to read memory, and I'm quoting Stephen loftus Merson from the r and here, is when we detect that all the VIs using that class are either <laughs> themselves reading memory. So we, we usually think that it's easier to unload something than loading, but it might not be the case. Okay? It can be a disaster. So basically, we have to make the color VI go Idle and unload that. <laughs> How to unload the framework? Um, there are several uh, ways to do that, but one way would be to use VI server to call the plugin code instead of calling the plugin code directly off the block diagram of your application. So we create a VI that we call run plugin VI. And we're going to run with VI server, open a reference to that VI, run the VI. And then in the end, when we are done with the execution of our plugin code, uh, close the reference to the caller VI. And the run plugin VI is basically the code that loads and executes the functions of the plugin. So let's do that. I run my VI. You can see in the dependencies that I only have the plugin interface so far. I run my plugin one. Now I open the reference, so the plugin one is in memory. Okay. As soon as so I'm done executing. As soon as I'm closing the reference to the caller VI, the plugin left the memory. Okay. So if you want to learn more about this, there is a very good. A blog post from Russell Blake. So you search on Google refu refueling in flight. Love you, craftsman. It's a love you, craftsman blog. And you have all the details on how to implement this. Again, if you have the bit.ly, you can download the slides and get the. Get the I like to use plugin architecture not only to load functional component plugins dynamically, but also to load UIs dynamically. Sometimes you have large application, but only, you know, management will, will only use that part of the application. Uh, test engineers will use maybe the bigger part, etc. So they don't need all the application in memory. So you can have, you can use plugin architecture to, to uh, basically load dynamically your code in memory as you use it in the application. So you define an additional layer based on the UI, how you can navigate through the UI. So again, you create kind of a plugin architecture with a plugin interface, the UI LBNFD. This is the only thing that will be loaded in memory when, when your application starts. So it's almost instantaneous. And then if you need to access the config, you can load the config and all the related functional plugins that it depends on. So I have large applications. I run them in memory. It's just couple megs. And as I navigate, it grows in memory uh, that way. So that can be really powerful. Uh, I'm sure you all have seen applications where you double click and you have to wait before something shows up. 
and it's not really looking good uh, for your customer. And you can plug in a UI. Yeah. So that you can put this on different screens or even different devices. It's all in your imagination. Yeah. Some recommendation tips and tricks when using PPM. Each module library should have its own project, its, its own product. It should have its own source code repository, control repository. I hope you all, all use uh, SCC. If your modules are intended to be used within multiple applications, agree on a central target location where you build, and I am sorry to Chris here. <laughs> You agree on a central location. See my company, my PPLs. The version, maybe, because it can be version dependent. And you put all of them in there. So you know where to find them, OK? And you can use the custom configuration file for your application exec table to tell explicitly my plugins are in this folder. So does this, in effect, start to behave like a global assembly cache of sorts? Sort of. Sort of. We actually use the, pro the public program data directory in Windows. That, that's uh, yeah, that's probably one of the good place. I, I I like also to put in like C Studio Vault because it's you know, when it was branding. It, yeah. it's, it's you. Uh, so VI search path and show load progress dialog equal false because you don't want to see when it's when it's looking linking to the path. You don't want to see that loading dialog that you have. <coughs> Always exclude dependent pack libraries when building your PPL. They are separate, separate products. No need to recopy something you already did and are developing independently. When you package your LVDB into a PPL, any dependency that is not in the runtime engine will be copied and packaged in the PPL. So basically, anything that is not the LabVIEW primitive, even if it's in VILib, like the space constant, we heard that the LabVIEW champion contest, contest that the space constant, constant is a sub-VI, it's not a primitive. Every time you're going to build a PPL that is calling the space constant, it's going to package that VI into the PPL. So you can end up with a lot of times the main VI in each PPL, so it, it's not really efficient in terms of memory. So an example, let's say you have multiple DQMH modules, and they are each packaged into a pack project library. We have these three classes that are dependencies of uh, DQMH, and they reside in VILib. And every time I'm going to package my module into a PPL, those three classes are going to be packaged into the PPL. And I end up with many copies of the same class into my PPLs. So I have PPLs that are larger, more data on disk, and more data in memory when you load them, because you load multiple copies of the same thing. So the solution, you create a PPL with your dependencies. So I'll show the example uh, for uh, DQMH, a DQMH project. So first, you create a library for your PPL DQMH. Disk. I'm going to move my yeah, class. <laughs> so you can slow down if you don't know this. So I move the classes into my library. I save all. So at that point, all my code now depends on the classes namespaced by the library. Now, now I go create a separate project. And this is that project that I will use to build my PPL DQMH library into actually a PPL. So I select my LBLIB, I create my uh, build specifications for pack project library. Uh, it's going fast, but you will all know what to do there. Okay. <laughs> all right. I close that, and now I have my PPL. Now that's the interesting part, Chris. You go back into your main application, which depends on PPL DQMH LBLIB. You right click and you do replace with pack library. You go find your PPL, and boom, now your colors depend on the PPL, not anymore on the LVD. Do you do that programmatically? Uh, no. With scripting, probably? 
No. I asked that question. Would it pause? Open eye, and they say no. There are ways to do it, but we don't advise doing it that way. So we we'll don't get to And this which, always which works, this replacement. For you. Uh, this replacement? Yeah. Yes. It doesn't work for me in some cases. No. I can share that over. Okay. So I'd like to take the opportunity to just maybe have uh, an eye of any people sitting at the back of the room to introduce quickly themselves, just their position. And if you have more questions on these kind of tricky things, uh, they will be there at the end of the presentation to answer. Uh, so Alejandro, yes. You have the best guys to answer yeah. all your questions. The specific question, there is not a public API for So uh, I continue the video. You need to not, uh, you should not forget to go back to your Ticker image and relieve and move back out your classes. So anything that is not built into a PBL is broken. You know, you want to to keep your BI lib as it was before. Okay. So now if I go into my application, you can see that I'm not depending now on the NVLib, but on the PPL. This is the QMH built into a PPL. Other recommendations, conditional disabled structure always execute runtime engine equal false. Regardless of you call your PPL from an executable or from the LabVIEW development environment, okay? So that's considered as a bug at an eye, and there is a bug report created for that. But be aware of this, it doesn't work. So if you want to know whether your call, whether your call is, is called from a PPL or not, you can use the PAC library path, and you use this VI reference, and if the path is empty, basically you are not in a PPL. So there is a path library palette that if you use PPLs, you should be aware of. There is just three VIs, but they do all what they need to do, all what you need. So the caveats now. You must rebuild your PPL for every LabVIEW version and OS, and this is solved now with backward compatibility. But uh, otherwise, you need to have that process in place. And at Studio Boss, we are building the tools to help you doing that seamlessly. It's not really to be a public product, but that's the intent. PPL expose your API to the API, to the LabVIEW developer. So, yeah, of course, if you take your PPL and you go into LabVIEW, you're going to see the BIs and you 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 bring the help and you're going to see the inputs and outputs. So if you are really, really concerned about protecting your IP and nobody being able to understand how your application is built, that might not be a good option for you. So be aware of that. Only include related VIs into a PPL. When you open a VI in a PPL, all the VIs in the PPL are loaded in memory. So don't use PPLs as a, as a store for all unrelated VIs. It's going to slow down. Uh, you're, you're, really yeah, you're, you're going to want to be very careful about your package design. Yes. <coughs> so, um, it helps in many, 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 many ways. Yeah, do it the solid way. Exactly, yes. do it the solid way. PPLs don't support MatScript, not sorry if you use MatScript. You can leave the room. It's not for you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, replace with path library is a one-way process only now, so it's coming in LabVIEW 2019. We should have the reverse way. Which when you want to debug, sometimes you need to go back to source and it, it's a pain. It's a pain. Other caveats, I have many slides with caveats. <laughs> uh, there is no built-in licensing options. You can license libraries with Diplat and other things, source libraries, but for the PPL, there is no meeting licensing options. And we will talk about that, but NXG should always start in the future. 
no easy way to build big pallets for DPL. Okay, even if you have your library containing a pallet into, uh, and you build that uh, and build it into a PPL, the pallet in the PPL will still reference the BIs in the source library. Which sucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I found out that the best way is to create your own pallet generator tool for PPLs. And it's not a big, big deal. And if you don't want to do it, you just ask me, and I'll sell you the source code of what I've done. And you can modify it to your needs. And I put that as a, build, a post build uh, action for my PPL build specifications. And whenever I build my PPL, it creates the pallet correctly linking to the correct files. Yes, Alan? Well, could Trump find the uh, BIs and PPLs with the PPLs and project? Sorry? Well, quick drop, fine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you're good. Who needs pallets? That's what he said. For discovery, sometimes you need to have pallets. And if you sell a regular product, you know, people are accepting to, to see your. Darren your... would say, Darren would say, well, you're fine. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you can't hover over the help in a, in a quick drop. So, just to be really precise, quick drop will find the public API of your PPI. The only thing that is private is. It is private. And private it yeah. Be found. yeah, exactly. <laughs> the library name is part of the namespace, which is an issue because a, a same type def in source is a different data type when it's built into a PPL. And NXG will address that by just removing the file name from the namespace, from the, from the fully qualified name of the PPL. Mm -hmm. PPLs cannot reference regular support files. You can still put uh, HTML pictures in your uh, library, but when you build them into a PPL, they show us missing files. Mm -hmm. PPLs cannot build if already in memory. So you cannot build with circular dependencies. And there are different views on that, but I believe you should have circular dependencies. But it's the same with LAMD. You cannot have two DOIs with the same name. Yes, right? yeah. exactly. So to summarize, you must have a solid build process in place to use PPL. And that's really what we are trying to do at, uh, at Studio Buzz, is really to give you the tools uh, to uh, make that uh, seamless. So let's talk about this build process. If we look at the components hierarchy, you have component A, with dip, which depends on component B and C, and C depends on B. You need to build bottom up, OK? So you first build component D into a PPL. Then you go to component C, and you replace the dependency uh, with the pack library. So now your component C depends on the PPL version of component D. And you do that bottom up. And in the end, you end up with component A, PPL, depending on all the PPL's version. If you look at the class hierarchy now, it's the opposite side. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have animal and bird inherits from animal and parrot and penguin inherit from birds. Uh, so you first need to build animal and then you go to bird and you change the inheritance of bird to inherit from the PPL version of animal, etc. etc. Uh, there is a tool MGI Solution Explorer, uh, it allows to uh, basically uh, build multiple speci build specifications in a specific order. So it can really reduce the pain. Uh, you define all the order, etc., and you can build all that uh, in one click. And it also detects uh, which library has changed and not, on and not. So it doesn't rebuild what is not needed. Also part of our build process to address Chris' concern is we generally build two versions of our PPL, one with debug, one without. Yes. So that in the runtime environment, we're pointing to the Buggable, you can't modify the code, but at least you can go in and interrogate, and then our release versions go against the release that have no. And MGI Solution button. Explorer has directly the option yeah. in the menu to build the uh, debuggable version of the release version. They have the same. Yeah. They have the same name. We just point to a different directory. So our program data, we have kind of a development and a release. So what is NXG doing to avoid those caveats that we are going to discuss? In uh, NXG, libraries have the G component extensions. I heard that it might change in the future, so don't take that as cache. 
it's similar to the LabVIEW library, the daily plus the build specification. So the, the component of the LabVIEW and XG library know, knows how to build themselves and what's the output of the build. You can organize your source code using multiple namespaces into the same library, okay? which you cannot do in Kurangia. So if we look in Kurangia, we have my library .lblib with x and y vi, x is too big. And if you look at the fully qualified name, you can see that the fully qualified name of the vi contains my the name of the library. Now if we look at LabVIEW and XG, we have my library .gcomp. We create a namespace A. The public VI is now named exported VI, and the library file name is not part anymore of the namespace. Okay, only the the, the namespace is in the fully qualified name. And for this will basically solve a lot of issues of cross-linking and swapping libraries um, in the future. So in NXG, we don't use the file name anymore, and this is true for classes as well. This is the vision, okay? All what I'm going to need to, man to mention is not especially available right now, even in the 3.0 beta, so uh, our folks at the end of the, at the back of the room are available to uh, give you more precision about what is there, what is not there, etc. Yes, please. So in your experience, have you tried migrating any LVLIMs and PPLs into NextGen using the migration utility? Yeah, just for the fun, yeah. <laughs> we have you for the, the furnitures of Vaughn. Okay, not to really use them, but to see how it behaves and it's not to be prepared. What is your recommendation at this stage? Um, so let me give you a scenario. Uh, say that this is the true scenario. So I haven't done any investment in PPLs and given the changes that are on the horizon. Would you recommend waiting before refactoring no. the PPLs before going? No, because it would be a lot easier if you do the, if you do refactor in PPLs now because it, it's really the same paradigm in 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 in, uh, in NXJ. Uh, your G components are going to be into GLLs. Um, it's pretty much. If you do that already in current gen, it's going to work pretty much the same in NXG. So yes, but along the road, he will have all the pain that you listed. Yes, but if you all want already to take advantage of the benefits of PPLs today, you it already saves a little bit of work for the future. So, in your opinion, is there's going to be pain either way? Is there is the pain lesser if I wait until I start in next year or start it now? I would go now. Yeah, they're extremely useful. Yeah. And, and right now, you are, you you are familiar with the environment and everything else, so you would just be learning that. Where if you wait until you go to NXG, you're learning the environment and everything else plus this. And so in NXG, they, they, they expect you to work like that in NXG. It's going to work like that. So if you do it right now, it, the migration will be also less painful, I think because it's using the same paradigm. Also, you can try, sorry, you can try one library at a time. Yes, but for one year at least, you won't be able to convert back to the source, the yeah. right, so that's, really, okay. that's, that's good. I'm trying to weigh out the advantages and disadvantages. He was going to say something, and I interrupted. Can you elaborate on what you just said? Like, in, in NXG, it's going to work in this manner? Like, you're going to be forced into that? That's how it's going to be? Uh, it's it's going to be yeah, the default behavior, and. Our guys will be able to elaborate on that if you want at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, but yeah, the default behavior will be, that will be that any library can be statically compiled into your application. So basically, you end up with a big application, everything statically linked. Or, which you should do, they're, they're each going to build into a GLL. So by default, each library is built into a GLL, right? I think you can choose. Let's discuss that later. Okay. I don't have the answer. I'm not sure. So yeah, the vision is that GLL is equivalent to PPL. It's binary. It can be loaded at application runtime, so you reference statically, and everything goes into the exit table. Or after the application has started, you can load dynamically from this your GLLs. It will be platform specific. Again, it's compiled code, so you have to recompile for RT and 
Linux. And, um, contains metadata, author, company, version, maybe there will be some more flexibility to add custom metadata. Wouldn't be unloadable like uh, when I showed unload the framework. You need to do the same trick. I, I don't know. I probably. probably. Well, what was the question? Oh, do, would the GLLs be unloadable in an easier way? So, yeah. question for those guys at the end. <laughs> that's the idea. Yes? That's the idea. Okay. That's the idea. Yes. So that's, that's there, there are live goals, so live goals. <laughs> so you will be able to build libraries independently or as part of the uh, calling application. So directly in your project, if you build an application in LG, it will automatically build, if needed, all the libraries called by the application. You work everything in the project. No need to keep track of the build hierarchy and perform the manual bottom-up process that I described. And XG will be able to consume a source or binary form of the library. No need to separate into different projects, as I said. And it will be a lot faster to build because, and it's true for any build in NXG, not only GLS, but exit tables, and it's pretty much copy from the cache to the target build you have told. Um, swapping libraries, that's a very, very big uh, improvement. You can replace in NXG, you will be able to replace in NXG uh, library by its complement form, so binary to source, source to binary, uh, by its debuggable binary form, different version of the same library, or a different library which has the same public interface. Okay, so a lot of flexibility no with that. So the library file name is not part of the namespace anymore, which uh, brings a lot, a lot more flexibility. You can choose to use the source or the binary form of a library. Names are now resolved by the project instead of by relative paths. So it will be almost impossible to have cross-linking with that. Names will, the eyes will not remember anymore the relative path. Will use the, the project will use the namespaces to resolve where are the problem. Multiple uh, hierarchical namespace in one library, and multiple different libraries can contribute to the same namespace. <coughs> so I didn't find any precise use case example, but uh, I think that it can be really interesting. So no need to revalidate and retest all the libraries every time you need to build your application. Other goals, protection of the libraries in NXG, uh, whether it's a, a GCOMP or a GLL, it, it's just a library, so you will be able to license the same uh, source or a bit version of the library. Who can view the code? Who can compile, compile against it? Who can use it at runtime? So these, these are all goals. It's not right now in the product. Support multiple engine versions as long. It, it might not be as easy as uh, at the beginning, because LabVIEW will evolve quickly, but between stable keybox of LabVIEW and XG, it's going to work like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So again, if you didn't take the picture uh, of the link, you can download the benchmarking code and the slides. There are more information on ni.com slash tech preview regarding NXG. Um, if you want to go to Cambridge in the beginning of September, it would be great. We have a new conference in there. And I will continue the discussion over there, more specifically about using PPLs for package, packaging and deployment. Okay, so more the deployment side of it. Okay, so more coming soon on PPLs. Please take the survey. We appreciate the feedback, whether it's uh, constructive or positive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you have questions, we are running out of time, but I'm happy to take them here until we get it out. And, uh, again, if you have more technical questions, we can say uh, we have a number of parents.